Hey, Pioneers. Welcome to episode number 405. I am excited for today's episode because one, I get to chat with a friend and you get to sit in on that conversation. But this is one where I get asked this a lot, but I'm also find myself very curious to see this of other people. And that is kind of like, what are they actually doing in real time? What are they using now? And especially within the world of herbs and herbalism. I mean, one of the beautiful things about herbs is there are so many different herbs that you can use for many of the same applications and or uses. And so I always love knowing what a herbalist, especially one that I you know respect and follow, what it is that their favorites are. And that can be nuanced by many different things. And if you are coming to a free herbal training that I'm going to be doing this September 27th, you will learn more about that. And how do you pick how do you know what those nuances are when you're picking them to make an herb best setted for you, best suited, not set it, best suited for you exactly. So if you have not signed up for our free mini summer herb course, you can register for the free masterclass I'm going to be doing on September 27th. And you can do that by going to melissaknorris.com forward slash herb, just the word herb, melissaknorris.com forward slash herb and snag your seat there. And I will walk you further along that process, along with some other really cool things inside that free masterclass. But that being said, I always like to know what a herbalist very favorite herbs are that they're using, that they're learning about, kind of their must-haves. And some of that is influenced, as I said, by each person's um, their constitutes. And we'll talk about more of that in great depth in the class that I'm going to be doing. But the other thing is what grows in your area, because that also influences or should influence some of the herbs that you're using. And of course, there are some herbs that pretty much will grow and do grow all across the U.S., the, you know, most of the different continents, et cetera. And so we'll be talking about those, but also there's some things that will grow very specifically to your area. And it's really good to learn how to use those herbs, know what they're for, how to harvest them because they are either growing prolifically in your area. They may be native. They may not, but they may be something that is very much naturalized in your area. But that is free herbal medicine right outside your door that you are not having to cultivate. You're not having to spend money on. I mean, can you tell I get a little excited about this topic? So <laughs> I'm excited to bring today's guest back and just have a really fun conversation where we chat about all these things and more with you. I think you're going to find it very valuable. And if you listen to our previous episode, actually going back quite a bit to episode number 328, and we'll put that link in the show notes today. And of course, in the blog post that accompanies this episode, which is melissaknorris.com forward slash 405, because this is episode number 405. So not quite a hundred episodes back, Kaylee from the Honeystead came on. And in that episode, we were talking about honeybees and plant medicine and how there's actually some of the things that the honeybees create is actually very powerful medicine and how those two intertwine. So I'm very excited to bring Kaylee back today. She has been doing a lot of fun things. I've been learning from her, and I think you are very much going to enjoy today's episode. Well, Kaylee, welcome back to the Pioneering Today podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk about some of the things we're going to discuss today. Yeah, me too. So right before we started recording, Kaylee and I were kind of going over like there's so many different herbs that you can talk about. In fact, there's more herbs then there is prescription medications or over-the-counter medications. And it's that's a beautiful thing because most that means that most climates have mm-hmm. herbs that will grow in their climate that they could grow themselves or forage if it's a, a wild herb that's growing. But then the complexity of that is there's so many herbs to choose from that you kind of get that paralysis of knowing like, I don't even know where to start. And I think a lot of people kind of get stuck there. So we thought it would be really fun to just kind of talk about in this season, as we're recording this, it's in summertime, but we're getting towards the end of summer. And I don't know about you, Kaylee, but for myself, I'm really starting to look at my medicine cabinet and making sure I have all the things stocked from this year's garden that we are growing 
for the upcoming cold and flu season and back to school, which usually means an increase in colds and flus. So, okay. So I thought it would be fun if we just kind of share what it is that we are harvesting right now and kind of our top things that we make we sure that we have on hand moving into this time of season. So I'm going to have you go first because I already know what I use. And <laughs> so I'm, I'm eager to see if we have the same or perhaps if we have different things. Oh, goodness. There's so much. Um, and it's such an abundance. So right now I'm still harvesting chamomile uh, is one of my top ones that we are, I'm just getting an abundance of chamomile and chamomile. A lot of people recognize chamomile and sleepy time teas. Um, but when we were talking, you know, it's, it's good to see that each herb offers multiple things. So chamomile might be a sedative, but it's also an anti-inflammatory. It's also an anti-spasmatic. So when you're looking at herbs, look and see all of the options that they offer um, so that you can kind of familiarize yourself with how to use them. So chamomile is definitely a big one for me. Um, I just harvested a good bit. I've got it drying right now in my drying racks. And then I set some up in, uh, in a tincture form. I also set some up in glycerin to make a, a glycerite tincture this go around just because I wanted it to be a little bit sweet and I'm a, kind of an alternative for people who are not a big fan of alcohol, especially your kiddos. Um, so I've got that. I just harvested a whole bunch of cat, uh, cat mint, which is one of the ones that we always say is great for like the whiny baby whether that's kids or adults, <laughs> um, but that's another really good one. I have some drying in, in leaf form. Um, I've also set some up in a tincture as well. And then I also set some up in an ACV, uh, apple cider vinegar. So I might add some honey into that and play around with some flavors, um, but great for the tummy, great for sleep, you know, just kind of all of those. Um, Goodness. I, I know we're going to be getting into the roots pretty soon. Uh, so fall, all the energy from the plant is going back down into the root. That's when I'll be harvesting some of my, my burdock. Um, I'm going to harvest some poke. I've got to do that. Okay. So one of the herbs that you just said, I am not familiar with, and that is poke. So talk to me a little bit about that herb. So a poke is one that I, we have growing around here, like essentially everywhere. Uh, I, we've got, it's the big berries. A lot of people get them confused with elderberry because they see that, that same color, um, yeah. but it's not, it's different. Uh, the small sprouts, like when it's smaller in the spring, you can eat the leaves which I've had, it's actually pretty good. Um, but the root can be used as well. Now, when you are learning about herbal medicine, if you're not a hundred percent familiar with it, you know, take the time to really, really understand it. And that's by digging in your books, pulling up all your resources. I've used poke in my clinical setting, uh, when I was in, when I was in herb school and we were working with a client that had a lot of, a lot of digestive and gastrointestinal issues. And we added a little bit into that formula. Now I understood kind of why, but I was still under the safety net, you know, of my instructor and learning. And so this year I'm going to, my goal is we're going to just dive in a little bit more and I want to understand. So that's where I'm going to pull all my research. I want to find out, see all the different ways that you can use it. Um, you know, the first year when you're foraging, you know, before you start foraging, really take the time to like learn and make sure that that's the same plant that you're, that you're going to be working with, you know, try to have a full basis of what you're going to be doing, uh, prior to harvesting. So that's kind of my next step is I know we're going into the season where I'll be harvesting the poke root. And then we're going to start figuring out how can we, how can we use it? How can we incorporate it into, um, into our setting? Or is it one that I just want to have on hand for the just in case moments, which there are plenty of plants that are, are good for those just in case, just in case moments. Yeah. And I think that's good because there's, there's some herbs 
And as you dive deeper into using herbs and having it just be a part of your everyday living and not treating them so much as a pharmaceutical replacement, because that's a mistake where I see myself when I first started learning about herbs, I'm like, I want the herbal Tylenol. I want their, you know, like I had like that. I was just going to swap out whatever that over the counter or, or maybe prescription depending on what it was. I just wanted the herbal equivalent. And I very much approached my early years in herbalism with that very Western mindset of, oh, you have a headache, take this herb, you know, two times a day or, you know, every four to six hours, like you have Tylenol and herbs are, are so different than that. I mean, there are in some instances that yes, you would take them multiple times a day just for a specific, um, acute symptom, right. but then there's also the herbs where, you know, when you're looking at adaptogens and there's just other herbs, depending upon your condition, that there's something that you're, that you're going to be taking on a very consistent basis, but then safety wise, there's some herbs that are meant to be used, just like you said, for a very short period of time, um, just in, in super instances only. And so I think that that's really important for people to realize that about herbs, not, not to get scared of them. Cause I also know a lot of people who are very leery of doing something wrong with herbs because it does feel foreign to them. They, it wasn't something they ever really saw anybody use, even though they're wanting to go the more natural route. And so they kind of are like, oh gosh, well there's, there's safety concerns. So maybe I shouldn't use any of them just because I don't know how to do it safely. And what you're saying, and, and my standpoint is that's where you educate yourself. Like right. don't sit in the fear but educate yourself. So you have a full understanding of it for yourself and then, and then actually proceed and and use it. And it may be where you are like, Oh, this herb is actually not for me Mm -hmm. and that's fine. And, but then move on and find, find the one that is, because there's so many different herbs, as we were saying earlier, you're going to find the right one for you, but it is going to take some effort. And in a lot of cases it is. And, you know, when you're working with, when you, when you're working with herbs, um, not always, I mean, a single herb works great, you know, but sometimes combining it with other herbs will enhance, you know, we look at the whole body when we're working with our systems. I mean, we'll, we'll look at each system of the body and pick herbs that will help facilitate, um, the actions that we're trying to achieve. So pairing herbs are a great way to, you know, to, to balance your body, Um, and that's something that I also really, I really do dive into. I also think another aspect that is very important and often missed when it comes to herbal medicine is, you know, why let's go to the root cause. So what, what is the root cause of, of your, uh, I don't want to say ailment, but what are you seeking? And then understanding, well, what causes that? Is it something that you need to eliminate from your diet? Is it something that you need to add to your diet? Do you need to add more water to your diet? I mean, there are so many things to kind of consider. And I feel like food is often kind of missed um, or lifestyle change is often missed when it comes with with plants. Now, I mean, I've had immediate reactions, um, the immediate effects from certain herbs like fever fuel. That's when I grow in my garden. I absolutely love feverfew. Do you grow feverfew at all? Or is that one, have you, have, have you planted that yet? <laughs> yes, we have, have lots of feverfew actually. And it just naturally, you know, it's great because it's a perennial, whereas I love chamomile and it is one that I harvest, but it is very prolific at self-seeding. But I found that feverfew for me comes back much better than chamomile because feverfew is more of a, an, a true perennial, whereas chamomile just produces a tens of blossoms. And if you let them go to seed, most likely some of them are going to come back the next year just from self-seeding itself. Yeah. And feverfew for me, I use as like a preventative, you know, so like having that on hand, I love that it self seeds because it's like, I don't even have to remember to plant you <laughs> like you just, you're just going to grow. Um, but I use it as a, as a preventative for migraines and my calls of migraines that I get is when the barometer drops or weather change, that's when I get a migraine. Um, so I try to like watch when that's happening and I'll take my leaf. I've eaten, I've eaten the leaves, I've tinctured it, you know, and it's a vasodilator. So 
that's the type of migraines that I get. Um, but that's one that I use quite often. And, you know, it's recognizing what triggers, like if it's something like a onset, quick onset of something like that. Yeah, that's a good one to have. Um, but, you know, I think that that's very important to, to consider, especially when you're bringing in the plants is help let help the plants do what they're supposed to do, which means help your body <laughs> take the things away that you need to take away or add the things that you need to add, depending on, depending on what you're seeking. So, yeah. Okay. So back to chamomile, cause that is one that I also harvest and like to keep on hand for, as you said, I think most people are probably the most common thought when it comes to chamomile, like you said earlier, is you'll see it in a lot of sleep sleep mm -hmm. things like take it at bedtime because it can help you relax. It can reduce anxiety, but I also use it with cold and flus because it can also help, um, especially with fever, um, with comfortability. And it's got some, you know, those different properties that can help when you're dealing with viruses, but we also have pineapple weed, which oh, yeah. grows phenomenally here. In fact, my pineapple weed comes back much more prolifically without me doing anything than my chamomile does. So I am in the process of harvesting my pineapple weed blossoms as well as my chamomile blossoms. And I just kind of put them together there. Um, and, and that is not always the case just because something is a, a lookalike necessarily doesn't mean it has the same medicinal properties. So also important to note, but in this case, pineapple weed and chamomile are related and they have a very, for the most part, they have the same functions medicinal wise. Mm -hmm. And so I harvest both of those and use them interchangeably with one another. That's fun. I had some pineapple weed growing at one point, and I think I actually eradicated it, which is something that I've, I'm kind of trying to really change a little bit in gardens and just the way gardens are, are grown. Um, I had a lot of people comment this year because in my garden, I had, you know, big stalks of mullein growing in the garden. And I just, I think bringing the weeds back into the garden is actually a, a good thing to have. And, and mullein, if you're, if I know you're familiar with it, but if your, your listeners and viewers aren't familiar with it, um, mullein is one you'll see it. It's, it's beautiful and tall and the stalk of it is can get really big actually and have beautiful little yellow flowers, but the leaves are so soft and the first year leaves are the ones that I, I like to harvest. Um, but if you have the second year or after it's already, you know, bolted, go for it. Um, but, you know, bringing the weeds back into your garden, I think is actually a really good thing. You know, why pull the ones that, you know, are going to offer something really good for you. We use mullein mainly for our respiratory health, the flu, the cold, the cough, you know, all of that mullein pairing with pairing mullein with your chamomile. If you're not feeling good, the chamomile is going to help with the achy pain. The mullein is going to help with your chest and, and just kind of, um, it's an expectorant, you know, so you're going <laughs> to hack up anything that you maybe have going on in your, in your chest. Um, and you can even smoke mullein too. Uh, smoking mullein, it, surprisingly, it's very cooling uh, for your lungs. But, you know, let's let's change the way gardens look and allow the weeds. I know you were telling me you, you're, you're saving weeds that people would pull <laughs> in your garden. Um, yeah, we were we were chatting earlier and I'm like, I should just hit record from the get go because I find so many of the, the pre recording conversations where we're kind of going through like, okay, let's make sure we, we talk about this today. And then we get sidetracked. I'm like, man, I, I should have been recording. But yes, and it's interesting because so much of what we have been taught mm -hmm. as weeds, like one all plant, all plants are plants, like who determined that this was a weed Be because it grows so prolifically, you know, mm -hmm. because it's not something that you are purposely cultivating. Like what actually, you know, what makes us decide a weed is a weed because now so many of us look at dandelions as weeds. Well, yeah. when you're not into herbalism, I should say right. Look right. At dandelion as weeds yet dandelions were introduced to America by the Europeans because they were yeah. so prized. They purposely brought them in order to plant them as food and medicine yet we look at them as something to spray with Roundup before right. we know better. It's and just there, amazing that perspective. There are, definite, there, there are definitely some uh, uh, thoughts about that, um, but this is where 
the empowerment I feel like is very important. You know, they're, they're grow the dandelion. It's not going to hurt you. You know, you can use all parts of the dandelion. I mean, we've made dandelion fritters with the, with the flowers, the root itself is amazing for your digestive system. I mean, if you roast it, decoct it, I mean, yes. Um, the leaves it's edible, you know? So, and who made that decision on what's a weed and and what's not? Um, I mean, I think that can go into a whole nother conversation. Um, but you know, changing the thought process of your garden and allowing the things that want you would once get rid of you know, look at them. Look, when you start learning about plants, you are going to walk outside and you're going to have a completely dis, just a, a completely change of, of just a complete change of thought process towards what you're looking at, because you're going to start to want to know more about, oh, well, what, what does that plant do? You know, I love when we have workshops here in the spring, we have the violet that's growing you know, there are so many edible plants that are literally all over, all around and just showing people like you can pick something up and you can eat it and it's not going to hurt you. Um, I, I've had people say that it demystifies, you know, the that whole thought of their entire childhood where, you know, your most children are taught don't eat anything from outside, you know, Um not that I'm like telling you to go tell your kids to go run outside and start eating random things, educate yourself, take them with you and, you know, do this together. Uh, but I think that that's what is the most beautiful thing about learning about the plants that are growing right outside your door is you would be completely amazed once you start looking at what each plant has to offer. And that, that to me is what blows my mind about, about plant medicine is just the abundance that is just growing out here right in the wild and it's free. So yeah. it blows my mind. So yeah. And it's, it, that is funny because I'm thinking back to when my kids were little and I guess taking it for granted because I grew up in the same area as my parents. So very familiar, you know, with, with the flora and fauna here, and always known just from the time I was little, my dad and mom would, you know, say like, okay, this you can have, this one you can't, you know, but I knew very early on what a nightshade berry was. And that was not one that you ate, you know, right. but here's right. the blackberries and here's the black caps and the salmon berries. And um, of course, there are cultivated berries that we grew, but there was also, like I said, the salmon berries. There was a lot of berries that um, grew naturally, currants, et cetera. And just knowing, you know, these are the ones you can eat and like chickweed. In fact, I think the chickweed was because it was out helping my dad fix fence and we were way out on the property and I just thought I was starving. And he's like, well, go pick that and eat it if you're that hungry. Like quit your whining and go eat some chickweed. <laughs> um, it's delicious. It really is good. Yeah. yeah. You can tincture chickweed too. That's great for your lymphatic system. I mean, they, these they're lymph movers, you know, so the, yeah. yes, that's the thing that I'm excited about. And like my children, they're not babies anymore. I've got, uh, my son is 16 and my daughter is 13, but from early on, it was like, let's go outside and let's, let's go, you know? And I'm telling you, if anybody has children that are like knee high and down, <laughs> those are the best ones to go foraging for because they have the perfect view <laughs> of everything that's in eyesight. So especially if it's mushroom season, morel, hush, morel mushroom hunting for my kids, they were the best at it. So <laughs> Yeah. It, the, morel hunting is better than Easter eggs because oh. it lasts longer. It's not just one day and they are so good. In fact, that's something still, even my kids are teens, same. My children are older now, 18 and 14. And we still love to go morel hunting in the spring. Like it's a family, like favorite, favorite thing to just go out and do. Um, and it's funny because that was one of the things what I teach people to do morel hunting is I say, change your eye level, mm -hmm. like actually get squat down and look, because if you're standing up and looking and then you squat down, you'll see ones you're missing and vice versa. It's funny <laughs> how it just, it, you almost will get double the mushrooms in an area just by changing your stance. So yes, absolutely. No, absolutely. There's such an abundance out there and it's just getting out there and looking, you know, and, and starting to just familiar, 
familiarize yourself. You, and in the beginning, learn five plants. Once you understand those five plants, keep going, you know, but there are sources out there to that. If you are not growing or if you're not foraging, there are ethical sources that you, you know, that you can get to, to bring in the plants as well. So, yeah. What are, what are your, some of your favorite of those ethical sources? Do you have, so, um, there's a few farms in our area that also, that will advertise and offer, um, plants. I took advantage of that in the past, but now I'm actually like really ramping up my growing just a stockpile for myself. Um, but so I always look at farms first that are local, see what they have to offer. You'd be surprised. A lot of them, a lot of them are pretty much, you know, everywhere. Um, but some of the bigger name people, uh, companies that I've, I've purchased from mountain rose, they have really good, good, uh, plants. Um, also Pacific botanicals is really good. I I do like them. The only thing that's different about them is when you buy, you get, you get like a bag, uh, versus like a mylar, uh, like a mylar bag that you would get from mountain rose or star West botanicals is another one. And then frontier. Um, but those are the ones that I've, I've purchased from if I need to purchase in large, large amounts. What okay. about you? Then that's plant purchasing the actual herb matter, not right. like the seed or the growing oh, parts of yeah. it, like the live plant. Yeah, no, not the live okay. plant. Um, I haven't found, I actually haven't really looked too much to see about live plants. That might I be found a um, strictly medicinal seeds.com. Oh, yeah. Now they mm-hmm. do sell the seeds as well, but they have a select of basically like the, sometimes it'll be starts, but a lot of times it's the, it's like the roots or yes. the crowns. Yeah. Um, and I've had pretty good success with them, but actually this past year I have our County, they do it once in the spring, you like pre-order and then you have to pick it up on one day. But at our County, the conservation district does a native plant oh, that's sale. Fun. And so I got like the native elderberries to our area. It was like, I think it was a, was it a bundle of like 10 cuttings that were rooted and growing? I mean, it was like 10, but I mean like so much cheaper. It was like what I bought from a nursery for Mm -hmm. an elderberry plant was like $30. And I got, I think it was 10 for the same price. So it was like three bucks versus 30 per, per plant was just really amazing. Of course it was very limited because they, they were focusing on what was native perennial plants to our area. Uh, but someone shared it with me this spring and I had, I didn't realize that you could do that. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Like it's so much cheaper. And I know that they're already naturalized. They're native to our area. So I'm not going to have to struggle and baby them to keep yeah. them growing. Like I, you do some of the other plants. So, so anyway, that, for live plants, that could be a good source. Yeah, that is a good source. And then also like for, for us, um, there's a neighbor down the road that has a massive elderberry. I mean, like it's huge. And I was like, can I please harvest some flowers? Because I couldn't reach mine. Um, so in return, like I bartered, you know, I brought some honey over, set it on their doorstep. And then I went frolicking in their, in their woods. I'm like the crazy neighbor. But <laughs> I asked, I was like, do you mind if I trim it a little bit? Um, because I wanted to root. And so I think I have, I would probably say about L, about 80 <laughs> right now that are rooting and I'm getting ready to pot them and then put them, put them all around here. Um, but that's another good way to get good way to get other plants too, is, you know, just asking and bartering. Yeah. Okay. So back to what we're bringing in for <laughs> cold and flu season or oh. what we're harvesting and bringing in now, do you have any other favorites that you're, you're bringing in at the moment? Um, I just harvested a whole bunch of Tulsi, um, holy basil. That's one of my favorites. Uh, it's an adaptogen herb. I mainly use it as an adaptogen herb, um, which basically, uh, for anyone who might not know what adaptogen is, it's an herb. It's a a category of an herb or in short, it basically helps your body maintain a beautiful balance, keeps your stress level down. And so, cause what happens is when you get sick, um, or if you get stressed out, seasons change, you know, holidays are kind of right around the corner, your, your body just kind of throws itself off balance. So I try to focus a lot on herbs that offer the adaptogens right now, just to maintain, just to, to help my body be restored and good so that it doesn't get thrown off. 
and then I don't get sick. So it's kind of like a preventative, but it also tastes amazing and it's delicious. Um, so I just harvested a whole bunch and I'm going back to get a little bit more um, so I can dry some and I'm going to infuse some in some honey. That's my next project that I'll be working on. Um, oh, I have not infused yeah. in honey before, but that could be a fun. I think so. Cause I, I'm not a big fan of the glycerin. I think it's too sweet. Um, so I'm going to try my luck at, uh, starting to incorporate more honey since we just did a massive harvest the other, uh, the other week. So we've got quite a bit that I've set aside specifically for infusing herbs with honey. So, I mean, honey is amazing as it is, but sometimes you want to have, you know, add that, add a little bit of medicinal property into the honey. Um, the other thing that I just harvested is, um, a Vena sativa, which is, um, milky stage oats. So I harvested the oat tops when they were premature. Um, okay. and it has this beautiful, uh, lacticarium, um, not lacticarium. Oh, I've got a brain. Fart. Sorry. I might've said it right, but I just completely had a brain fart. Um, so I'll just put in, but it has a, it has a beautiful like milky substance that's in it. So when you take it and you, uh, pulverize it, it, uh, it releases that. And then I have some tincturing here in a hundred proof vodka, but uh, Avena sativa oats, it's regular oats. Um, you can use the oat tops prematurely in that form to get that beautiful milk that, that it offers. Um, you can use the straw itself, which is what I have to go back and harvest because now it's starting to, to, uh, now it's ready. So I did the oat tops. Now I'm doing the oat straw. Um, and then we also use the dried oat tops, but we use, we use milky stage oats or Avena sativa. It's, it's beautiful for your nervous system. Um, it just oh. helps. I, I kind of, the way I describe it is, is if you're frazzled, it kind of just settles the frazzle. It, it really helps maintain your nervous system as well. Um, and then the other thing that I was doing a lot of reading on, which I think is actually really interesting. There are individuals who are, um, if you're coming off of prescription medicine or substance abuse, um, there are some really amazing information about, out about milky stage oats to kind of keep your, to kind of calm that nervous system down. Um, so I thought that was really interesting, but we use it. I use it before I go into Walmart <laughs> in all honesty, because I'm like, I have got to come. I'm not a big fan of big grocery stores or big stores. Um, so that is how I use, I use my, my milky stage oats. Okay. I've not done the oats yet, but I've been looking at them actually for cover crops. So I'm like, Oh, perfect. It is um, perfect. Yeah, I could get two. Well, as you said, many applications because you're yeah. using yeah premature that straw and the top and then it's dried. So, okay, well that just went a little bit higher on my list now for adding to the cover crop. <laughs> and you, I mean, it it grows. It's so quick. It's so easy, and you can cover. I think I used a, I think I used about a pound, and I got a pretty decent size area that you know, it's just perfect. And I mean, it was easy to grow, easy to harvest. And it's one that it could be used as a food source as well in the, if needed. Um, but we add the dried oat tops to a lot of our tea blends, as well as the oat straw, mainly for just the nourishing of your nervous system. That is, that is my favorite. Okay. That is awesome. Um, we'll see. I, I learned another one. I, I've heard of using oats medicinally. I just said it's one I haven't div dove into yet myself. So that's super fun. Um, I have to say right now, not quite yet. I'm going to wait until the first frost, mm -hmm. but my marshmallow plants are finally mm -hmm. old enough to harvest the roots. And I am so excited because <laughs> <laughs> I use marshmallow root all the time, but I haven't yeah. actually gotten to the point where my plants were mature enough to yeah to get to harvest the roots. So this will be my first year getting to harvest my own marshmallow root. And so I'm super excited because that's one. I, I don't know if you noticed this, but I've noticed within myself and of course with my own family that we can all get what I'm assuming is the same cold because we'll all come down with it at the very, pretty much the same time, have very similar symptoms. 
But whenever I get a cold, I tend to get very dry in the vocal cords mm-hmm. and my throat and I have very dry coughs mm-hmm. and I'm prone to laryngitis. Like I'll go hoarse and stay hoarse for a long time. Whereas like my husband is the opposite and he always tends to get the really wet um, and it'll settle in his chest deeper, but in like a wet manner. So for me, I love the, and I'm pointing because it's right outside my window here or <laughs> recording, but you guys can't see it. I'm like, I love the marshmallow because it is so soothing to that dry, scratchy, irritated, especially when you feel it like in, in the throat and in that vocal cord region. Yeah. So I'm so excited because it, I can harvest it myself. I don't have to buy it this year. And so for the same thing that, so what you were saying with your throat, all of that mucilage um, from the root itself, what it can offer for your throat, but I use it for my digestive system because when I'm sick, I tend to get, I'm like, it goes to my gut all the time. So I need something that's going to soothe. I need something that's going to help with like the spas, the anti-spasmatic. So I'll use the marshmallow root. I'll do a cold infusion. I'll drink a quart of it. And in a matter of a day or two, and then, um, then I'll bring in other plants that might offer like the, the cat mint. Um, that's great for upset stomach. So is lemon balm. I'll also do meadow sweet too. Meadow sweet's a good one. I, I grew meadow sweet this year, but I don't know quite what happened to it. So luckily I was able to, you know, get a little bit from a source. <laughs> um, but yeah, meadow, marshmallow root is lovely. The leaves are also, you can also use the leaves. So we've tinctured some of the leaves as well. Um, but uh, that's exciting. That is very exciting. <laughs> Yes, I still I, have uh, a year on mine and a few of my plants. I have a year. So <laughs> yeah, the, the problem is I'm like, I don't want to dig them all up because they're so pretty. No. <laughs> so I'm trying to decide right now. I'm like, okay, how much do I really need to take to get my stock to where I want it to go through the year? And then of course I'll start m- more to replace that. Um, but I think I'm going to leave at least a third yeah. to then harvest for next year. And then just kind of keep a continual cycle of replanting. So I'll always have some root that is of large enough size. The other thing that I thought was interesting about the marshmallow, and this is something I want to dive a little bit more on, on, um, but hollyhock, um, the it's in the same family. And from what I've understood, and again, I'm going to dive a little bit more because a lot more people have hollyhock growing in their area um, and, you know, as decorative, beautiful plants. Um, so I, I started hearing people talk about using the root in the same, same way as marshmallow root. So I'm like, yes. huh. um, Carolyn from homesteading family, Carolyn Thomas, her and I are very good friends and she uses hollyhock yeah. much like you would marshmallow root. I know, especially the leaves for me, it's funny. And again, like, this is such a regional thing, but it's also good to know because hollyhock actually marshmallow grows better for me. Hollyhock yeah. gets rust for us. Really. It's very prone to rust. And in most, our summers are usually more on the wetter and the cool side. And so I rarely, I try to grow hollyhock just because I think it's so pretty, but yeah. I, we battle the rest so much that marshmallow actually does. It's a much better suited for our climate. Um, but for other people, that's not the case. Like for some people, they are too dry actually and hot marshmallow. Once it's established, it's okay, but it does actually prefer a little bit more wet, damp conditions overall. Um, right. But yeah, it, that I think that's what's really cool too, is there's so many different plants that have very similar properties mm-hmm. that even if can't grow or get one, you'll likely be able to find another herbal equivalent that's very similar and can offer you pretty much the same thing. Yeah. I think that's amazing. I really do. And just learning, like I said, you know, going out and picking one plant and learn about it and see what it offers, because that's where your mind is just going to start being blown. Um, And then it's like, you are going to forever be learning for the rest of your life with herbal medicine, as long as you know, at least the basics and know how to find the information. Um, It's a lot to retain. So, you know, that's where for a new person who's getting into herbal medicine, just don't, it's not a scary, you know, just one plant at a time. And you'd be surprised that one plant has multiple things that it can do. Um, and then just kind of 
learning about your sources, figuring out your, your, the books that you use. I have a lot of books. Um, of lately I've been, uh, on the, um, herbal, the Andrew, Andrew Chevalier herbal encyclopedia book. I've been sharing that one a lot. Oh, I don't know that one. Yeah, it's a good one. Um, it's a great herbal encyclopedia because what it does is it'll offer uh, pictures of the plants and then also kind of goes into detail. Of, like it can be tinctured, it can be powdered, which I, I did just learn um, from his book uh, about the holy basil. You know, I use, I use it as an adaptogen, um, but I found through his book that you can actually, you can powder it and use it use it on your, your, um, your gums as well. Uh, which I was like, Oh, okay. That's, you know, for infection and anything like that. So, you know, the, the different ways to use the plan, I think is beneficial. Um, but his book so far seems to be pretty good. Oh, good. Yeah. I love having, uh, new, new resources that have been vetted. <laughs> right. Um, and that's kind of, that's part of the, the crux of it is, um, and I don't know about you, but I also get and I totally understand where people are coming from. They're like, well, if you could only have one herb book, what would it be? Or like, what is the one herb book? And I'm like, I never, personally, I never trust one source mm -hmm. when I'm learning it from about an herb. I always am looking at multiple sources. And so I, I'm like, I can't tell you one herb book because I, I don't think there is one. And I don't think that's how you should approach it to begin with. I understand the wanting of that, like wanting just like that one place to start with like one book. Um, but I'm always like multi, multi-source checking because you'll find not necessarily contradictions between sources sometimes, but usually I'll just find like this, a different nuance Mm -hmm. on the same herb from a different author or a different source. Or just like you said, like you just found that from him where I've studied Tulsi and I've never seen that yeah. from what I've studied on using it on the gum. So I think there's a, a great benefit to making sure you're learning from multiple sources, even about this, especially about the same herb. Absolutely. And I think too, I mean, and it really depends on like what type of how, how you learn. You know, so I know you and I have talked in the past, we're both kind of geeky, nerdy when it comes to the scientific stuff, you know, yeah. <laughs> but not everybody is, you know, not everybody learns that way. They don't necessarily want to know the, the phytochemical breakdown of the plant and how it works in each system of the body and what it facilitates. I like to, I like to know that, but I also like to know the story. You know, I, I, I like the history of the plants. I like the, the folk, I guess, um, you know, how it was used in the past. Um, and I also always kind of do double check and see if there's any, any research studies that have been used, um, specifically for that plant. Cause I'd like to see, Hey, there's some scientific backing for this. Um, like Tulsi, the same thing, learning about that, uh, it, through his book, you know, he also offered how it helps, um, how it might be able to help with diabetes, um, and lowering blood sugar. I'm like, wow, that is something that, you know, we could, I'm going to dive a little bit more in and, and learn, um, because mainly me, like I'll use Tulsi as an adaptogen, but it does so much more. Um, yeah. so, you know, and ha it's okay to have multiple books. I do the same thing. I'll grab all of my books. I'll open them all up. And I'll read from my specific ones like, oh, he has, you know, she's experienced this plant this way. And, you know, that's how it's a collective knowledge after, after time. And, um, and even like with you and your study right now, I mean, you are learning your own way of each plant and how it helps you. And that's what I think is amazing is it, by actually using the plants, feeling them, knowing what they're doing, um, and being able to share that with somebody else. I mean, I think that that's, that's how we continue this. That's how we plant seeds of there are alternatives. There are ways. And a lot of it is growing free right outside. Yeah. Well, I think that wraps this up perfectly. So Kaylee, for those who are wanting to learn more about what you guys are doing, I know you're doing a lot of herb and bee and honey, mm -hmm. honey, fun things there on your guys's homestead. Where's the best place for folks to connect with you? Um, so I have a website, uh, it's 
thehoneystead.com. Um, I also share quite often on videos on YouTube and then all the other platforms like Facebook and Instagram. Um, I'm got a lot of things in the works that we'll be kind of sharing uh, more some exciting things that are happening. Uh, so, um, but yeah, I have a lot of projects that I'll be working on, but, um, but yeah, you can find me on, on pretty much all this, all the social medias as the Honeystead. And we do a little bit of everything, gardening, foraging, definitely herbalism, um, and a lot about beekeeping as well, because bees use plant medicine and that's, that's also part of it. Yeah. Awesome. I have to say, I, you did a video earlier this year in the springtime on horsetail. Oh yeah. And horsetail grows very well here. <laughs> it's what we've looked at is a nuisance. <laughs> and when you share that had medicinal properties, I'm like, get out. And so I actually <laughs> went out to, to the patch where we've got some horsetail growing and I'm like, oh, and it's so funny. Cause now I don't look at it with like, oh, you're, you know, like you're invading my space. I'm like, oh. Mm -hmm. You have, you have a purpose. I just didn't know it. So anyways, yeah. that was kind of fun. Um, I really enjoyed that video because I mean, I, I had the same situation with stinging nettle when I was a kid, I found a stinging nettle patch and I hated stinging nettle until I became an herbalist and started to realize that that is probably one of the best plants that you can use <laughs> for your overall health. Um, so yeah, it's, that's exactly that. You just, you're, you're learning a different relationship, learning to have a different relationships with the plants that are around you. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming on. This was fun. And I, can, I know we'll chat again soon in the future. So thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> well, I hope that you enjoyed that episode as much as I did. It's always a joy to get to visit with other like-minded people and learn from them as well. So I hope that you want to continue your herbal learning and make sure that you are signed up for the free herbal masterclass. I think it's the last time I will be doing it this year. So snag your seat at melissaknorris.com forward slash herb. And I can't wait to see you there. On to our verse of the week. So this week's verse, we are in the Psalms and Psalm 5 chapter five, verse 12. So the amplified translation of this is for you, O Lord, bless the righteous man, the one who is in right standing with you, you surround him with favor as with a shield. I have been doing some different uh, Bible studying and reading on the armor of God. And of course, one of those is the shield. But what I found was interesting is usually, at least myself, when I think of a shield, I think of that as more a protection, um, a, a protection thing that you are holding up. You're not necessarily fighting. Sometimes you are. Sometimes you are you know, holding a shield and then actively fighting with one hand while protecting with the other. And sometimes those things go together. And sometimes a shield is just something that you, that you are holding as a protective defensive measure, not necessarily offensive. But I was reading more on shields and in the Bible, the reference of shields and that. And I just thought this was very interesting. So I wanted to share it with you. It was one of those kind of aha things. I was reading it last night before bed and it stuck with me again this morning. I went back and reread it again this morning. And I thought, I think this is the verse that I really want to share with folks. And thinking of favor as a shield just gives a completely different connotation, at least in my mind, on the shield and the way that God is for us and, and works for us. And of course, you've got the first part of, the, of this verse that says the righteous man, the one who is in right standing with you, but that God surrounds him as a favor. And I was actually reading um, a book. It was a devotional that was talking about the armor of God. And I'm trying to remember the title of it. It's by Perry Stone. And I think like the piercing of your armor or something along those lines. Anyhow, if you do it, Perry Stone under his books, I'm sure you will find it on Kindle. But what I thought was interesting was the way that he said, when we think about the Lord's favor as a shield, like what does that actually mean? And so in a very practical sense, if you have God's favor, that goes before you a lot in relationships. And so 
naturally having God's favor, you can go into a situation and if you have his favor surrounding you, that is going to make it more agreeable. And I know there's a lot of ways to take this out of context. So say, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that we can use this as like a magic genie or that God could ever be used like that as like kind of my wishes and I follow these and everything's going to go smoothly for me. But when you do have God's favor, we can look at Joseph, for example, in the Bible, when he had God's favor, even though he was in some really difficult situations, even when he was in Potter's house, he rose to favor. And of course, then you had the wife, he got thrown into jail, but then he rose to favor within the jail jailer system. And then he was presented to Pharaoh and was able to determine what interpret Pharaoh's dream. And then he rose to favor within the courts of Egypt and was really, you know, high up second only to Pharaoh in ruling Egypt during that time frame. That is only done by the favor of God. Um, you know, it can be you going in for a job or being in a certain situation where it wouldn't necessarily make sense that you would have favor, but somehow, you know, you do, and that that is God working. And that as long as we are in right standing with him, that his favor is like a shield around us and can help work in many situations and especially situations where it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, but it's only from the hand of God and us finding favor because of him in those situations. So I just thought it really broadened the way that I look at the armor of God and look at the way that God protects us and loves us. And I wanted to share it with you because I, I thought it it stuck with me. And so those things that really stick with you and make you think um, are very interesting. And especially me, like looking back um, at different situations and being like, well, that was a hundred percent God's favor. Like that wasn't me. I mean, of course I like, I should say, I like to think I'm great. That sounds really weird to say, but I think we all like to think of ourselves in the most part as being, you know, good people and all of that. But when I'm being very honest and looking at that, I can say, oh no, all of that was actually because God had surrounded me with his favor. That wasn't really truly my own doing. Um, and anyways, it made for a very interesting look at things, past things, and even present things. And of course, going into the future as well. And I found it very comforting and uplifting and kind of eye-opening. So I wanted to share it with you guys as well. Thank you so much for joining me today. I will be back here with you next week, but until then, blessings and mason jars for now, my friends. 